Hello, uh, welcome, and thanks for stopping by. I know you've had a lot of choices to make uh, throughout the really incredible uh, session agenda for Content Marketing World this year. Uh, today, for our session, it's a bit of a case study environment where we're gonna be focused on better understanding content engagement insights as it relates to complex B2B buyers and their consumption of B2B content. The session's titled Strategize to Maximize. I'm joined here today uh, with my colleague, uh, Peter Tarrant, who's over at uh, Topalti. He's the ABM manager. I'll let him briefly introduce himself, his role, and a little bit more about the organization. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, David. Yeah, of course. Uh, and as mentioned, I'm Peter Tarrant, the account-based marketing manager at Topalti, and I run you know, all of our display, social, direct mail, syndicated programs here, um, and we target CFOs, controllers, and, and finance decision makers um, to help them uh, to automate their payables automation solutions. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm Dave Fortino. I head up audience product and marketing over at NetLine. This session is, uh, you know, it's exciting for me because this is the fourth, I believe, year that we've been back to content marketing world specifically focused on sharing customer success stories and really letting them articulate some of the challenges that they're experiencing in the marketplace and ultimately how they've gone about solving those challenges as well. Um, my portion of the session today is really focused on educating you, the marketer, who's specifically tasked with content marketing strategies uh, to really better understand the complete market dynamics that are occurring when consuming your content or even engaging with your content and better understanding the types of behaviors that are occurring across the B2B web. And so we'll dig into that. And Peter's going to dive in more deeply as to once that content's being propagated throughout the web and you're actively trying to target your preferred ideal customer profile and or target prospects, what do you do with the, that data that's being obtained and how do you ultimately capture that data to drive high conversions that preferably translate into pipeline? And then lastly, we're going to have a couple free goodies for you to leverage and take away with you. So uh, let's get on with the show. And before diving in, you know, Peter, if you've got any perspectives along the way, uh, whether it's in, uh, in agreement with some of the things I'm sharing <laughs> or perhaps challenging it, that's completely fine. We can try to keep this loose and uh, you can chime in at any time. We'll do. I'm pumped for this agenda. So that's great. Great. Uh, yeah, you're a big part of it. So you should be. Um, yeah, from, from my side, I, I think what we'll do is we'll dive into some really jarring metrics that I think will command attention, um, sometimes be scary, and we'll get into that in a moment. And so right off the bat, 85% of B2B marketers are saying lead gen is the most important content marketing goal that they have. Makes sense. You go through all of this time creating amazing content, budget allocation, talent, whether internal or external, and so on. If you just create that content and actually don't have a true goal associated to that, being lead gen, and I'd argue pipeline, uh, what was the point of creating in the first place? And so this gets to the next element. Yet 61% of marketers rank lead gen as their number one challenge. So it's crazy, right? When you think about that, 85% say that's the largest goal for content marketing, yet 61% are finding it to also be the most difficult thing to do. And so... My perspective and observation comes from our position in the marketplace. Uh, we operate the largest content-centric lead gen platform on the web. We support thousands of customers across nearly 10,000 pieces of B2B gated content. What's more often than not the case is that there's a massive disconnect between marketers' expectations of prospect behavior and ultimately what's occurring. And so what we're going to do is dig in a little bit more deeply into some external market perspectives, but also dive into our annual uh, B2B content consumption and demand report. This report specifically focused on the analysis of 5 million leads, and we'll get into that a little more briefly. But right off the bat, these are stats that you guys have seen, I'm sure, at every conference and now every webinar. And they're certainly here to both provide education and obviously reinforce known metrics, but also perhaps instill a little bit of fear as to how challenging the marketplace is, how cluttered it is, especially now. 
because everything that was kind of evenly balanced between online and offline is now completely online. And so these are things that you need to take into consideration as to how you're going to break down and break through a lot of that clutter. This one really sticks out to me, which is 49% of your buying committee inside your target accounts will never actually reach out to you prior to making a purchase decision. That's staggering, right? It, especially if your product doesn't have a self-service derivative or companion. Uh, at that point, you're simply operating in a silo. And so it's really great to understand how your content's driving progression through the pipeline, engagement with your brand. And ultimately, even before that's occurring, understanding how your market will engage with your brand. And so the metric here that's always shocking to most marketers is that 86% of all B2B content consumption occurring across our platform occurs below the C-suite. And so this gets back to this um, you know, distinction between perception versus reality in B2B markets and that every marketer is hearing from their CMO saying, we need to target senior decision makers, preferably in the C-suite, in these size companies or this industry and so on. Yet, it turns out that most of those folks never actively consume and or engage with gated content. They just don't. They don't have the time, the resources, the bandwidth to do it. And it's ultimately why they hire everybody else on their orgs to do so. Whether you call that the buying committee, uh, the influencers, just decision makers inside the organization, it's really key to understand not only this metric, but how each one of those sub personas is consuming content. And so now we're going to get into this, some of the scary stuff. And so that first section there was reality. Um, a lot of that externally known, not necessarily externally reported on a ton. So I thought it was good to bring up. And, and David, if I might, before you sure. dive into the scary stuff and um, just from an account-based marketing and, and sales perspective, we absolutely have, for any ABM campaign that we run, have the sales reps make sure they add three to two, three to five contacts per account to our different campaigns. Um, just because, you know, it's, it's, you do want to have that, that senior executive in there, but um, it's oftentimes um, in our world, in the accounts payable and finance world, it's the people that are doing managing accounts payable, not the CFO that um, sees the pain and is, is tasked with analyzing different, payables automation platform. So those are oftentimes the people that will get the first engagement and first touch uh, yeah. meeting alongside. That makes a ton of sense. Um, you know, and that really gets to a lot of interesting stuff that's a completely separate session, but thinking about how custom content journeys specific to each one of those personalities, not personas, but personalities with inside that target account could benefit from different messaging, different packaging, uh, different presentation of largely the same amount of content, the same type of content, but speak to their pain mm. points, right? The end user of your software is completely different than the CFO. They have completely different needs and so on. So maybe maybe next year. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, on this side, what we wanted to do is really demonstrate how much B2B content is being consumed. And so we took a, a reverse analysis look at all of the leads that we've processed for our customers over the past year. And I asked engineering and business intelligence, what would that look like in terms of just the raw data of storage volume? But then can we try to visualize that too? Most people really won't have a tangible effect as to what 16 petabytes of information means. So we try to visualize it this way, which is that ultimately if you took all of that data and printed it out, uh, you're looking at 319 million file cabinets, either stacked vertically or horizontally. And I believe the math there was that if they were stacked vertically, it was about 1.6 trips to the moon and back, and that's in one year. And so all of that is, I hope, a real clarity providing moment where you can look at the challenges that not only your brand's facing and breaking through the clutter, but also your prospects, right? They're inundated with the amount of content that they're experiencing and engaging with. And so the task is up to everyone, not just you, myself included, Peter, uh, that our games constantly have to be leveled up. Events like this 
every year, everyone who attends and or virtually attends this time around walks away better than where they were prior to coming to the event. So it's not as if this is a secret, right? You're leaving with skills and tools that allow you to level up your profession, but sadly, so do all of your competitors. And so that creates the real need to have content that solves a lot of it because strategies and tactics will most certainly be replicated. So getting to this, we already really talked about how difficult it is in the marketplace. And I'll try to educate you ultimately so that you're not looking like this. Um, thankfully, content marketing world is super heavily attended, even virtually this year. So it's phenomenal to see everyone uh, participating in this way. And the goal, though, is for you to never be this person, whether for your own content, uh, perhaps, or if you're the marketer inside your organization looking around for support. Let's eliminate that from occurring. And so we publish this report every year. I've distilled some high-level observations that we can share now. Peter's going to dive in afterwards, really after you know, absorbing this data over years of working with us, how, how he goes to market and how ultimately he leverages content to drive pipeline and share some ideas around that. So the purpose of this is just a quick summary into the report itself and some of the underlying philosophies. Ultimately, this is done by processing the greatest volume of first party sourced and fully permissioned first party leads on a performance basis for our customers. So why do we create this report? I, I think it is a really important moment in Netline's history. And as content marketers, I think you should really try to channel our conclusion, uh, not necessarily with how we went to market with this report, but it was very much about translating our existing internal goodness, right? That special sauce that we coveted and we're perhaps fearful of sharing externally and, and really externalizing that data, weaponizing it and allowing us to package our, our data, the core value that we deliver to our clients in a way that's education forward. And uh, ultimately that's what the report was all about. We also decided early on that this report was never going to be about netline pontificating or myself included about what's happening in the marketplace. The data will drive the ultimate findings uh, and the data will be externalized for everyone to analyze as well. And so ultimately, as we went through building this report, it, it really became apparent to us as well that we didn't want to be in a position where we we're, I don't know, publishing another survey based report, whereas 200 marketers posturing to each other and Peter and I trying to sound who's smarter by filling out a survey. Um, that's definitely not what we wanted. And so we went into this trying to find ways to uh, compartmentalize data sets that really weren't externally even known. And some of those, which this one here, the consumption gap was something that we didn't even think of. We just happened to receive these two data points from engineering that light bulb moment went off, which was, wow, okay, we're tracking not only the types of people, their roles, their industries, job levels, company size, targeted accounts, and so on, and their consumption patterns. But also we know exactly when that user ultimately gets around to engaging with that content. And so most marketers and also salespeople like to think that a user registers for content and instantaneously because they have access to the content that they ultimately do access that content. What's staggering is that almost in every case they don't. And so they register for the content Webinars being one, they have every intention on sitting around for that webinar, but they ultimately don't have the time, attention, or someone pulls them into another meeting, whatever other fire might be occurring. And that creates the consumption gap. And so the consumption gap is nothing more than the time between when a registration for your gated content occurs and ultimately the time between them uh, getting around to actually whether downloading or reading it, listening, viewing it, that content. And so what you're seeing here is the consumption gap uh, visualized by hours, the percent increase and or decrease. So decreased is good in comparison to last year's metrics. Increased on the right-hand side is bad. And so what you're seeing here is on average, you're looking at about a day before, you know, 24 hours before that person who registered for the content ultimately gets around to digging in and you know, trying to engage with your message, your brand, and your voice. Uh, 
what's interesting here is, is again, you can see some of the lower level roles, like an individual contributor, it only takes them 22.7 hours to engage with that content. And that's actually decreased versus last year by 8%. Let's flip the paradigm and go over to the right-hand side and you'll see a C-level person takes nearly 35 hours and that's actually gotten longer by 16% versus last year. So definitely some things to think about there. Uh, this could again be another track where you look at your existing nurture path and also how you're escalating leads over into sales. If sometimes you're jumping the gun and there's actions occurring before that time, that moment in time is occurring, you're saying things that that prospect doesn't understand yet. They don't have the context as to what might have been included in that ebook or white paper or on that webinar. It's not that you can't send those messages, you probably should, but you need to tweak that copy to be context appropriate and lean into where they're at at that specific moment with your brand. So sticking on that same topical theme around the question of time, I think all of you love to always try to do research, especially when you're talking about email marketing strategies, when's the best time to reach out to a target buyer. And again, this is only B2B specific, so I can't comment uh, as to the implications of such a, a recommendation in the consumer space. But what's wild here is Tuesdays and Wednesdays by far lead the way. Uh, I think there was a historical consensus that Mondays were very good and, and Tuesdays, but it, it certainly turns out that you know, Mondays and Thursdays tend to be about the same. Wednesdays ultimately are the best on a daily basis. How valuable that might be um, as it relates to your nurture paths or even when sales follows up, I think you should take that into consideration, but we can really dive in a little bit more deeply here and provide you a bit more value. And so, we looked at all of that data. And so if you took the 5 million leads that were processed and all of the petabytes of data, it generates a few, what was it? 455 billion external data points associated to every single user, uh, their full composite profile of the, all of their registration data, their consumption patterns, uh, their device form factor and so on. And so across all of that, Tuesday is the best day, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard was where we obviously are. Um, in context, it actually would be 10 a.m. local for that specific person. And then the next best times are 12, 9, and 4, still on Tuesday. So interesting there. Ask yourself when you get back to the office uh, and or virtually uh, interact with your colleagues, try to better understand what you're doing now and then leverage this data to, to lean in again on trying to target your prospects and or even your existing clients uh, at those times. I think what's funny about sharing that stat, it's something that we've never shared before. And my fear is that by sharing that stat, do we become the tail wagging the dog? And at some point, everyone's sending the, their emails at that time. I hope we're not guilty of that, but we'll, we'll see, see uh, how the data shakes out for next year. Well, I, I do know one thing. We'll have to stop uh, doing our engagement on Saturdays and Sundays now. So that was that was that's what we're doing wrong. <laughs> um, Great. But I, I am curious if you, you do see any just at a high level, nothing crazy, but any any trends uh, by country. Um, for example, I know Israel works um, on on Friday on on Sundays. I believe it is. Um, their weekends, Friday, Saturday. So I'm curious if like you saw any interesting trends that-, that... Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and I would love to, you know, after the session, we can even break that out. Or maybe we'll even offer it as a supplemental piece to go with the deck uh, that's already been created. Yeah, but cool. yeah, I know all of the data exists. Um, the problem for us yeah. as it relates to smaller consumption populations is that they statistically don't get to- uh, altering outputs unless they're isolated by country, right? So mm -hmm. the consolidation of all the data that we processed is what you saw. But yeah, providing a country by country analysis or even country by job area or industry or job level would be a cool matrix to generate too. Good idea. I know we'd use that for sure. All right, cool. Yeah, so mm -hmm. another piece coming your way. So um, on the content resonance side, this really comes down to some really basic ideas. Uh, and again, this is not about Netline telling you things that you have or haven't heard or trying to interject opinions. This is just completely based upon 
the raw processing power of all of the content consumption that's occurred. And so, as you can imagine, uh, anything that tends to be simplified and presented in a, in a somewhat humanized fashion, I think a lot of those tend to use numbers and or listicle type formats, always resonate extremely well. What's important to note there is that resonance means different things to different marketers. And so just because a piece of content resonates extremely well doesn't necessarily mean that that translates into pipeline for you. And so I don't want this slide to be interpreted as, oh, if you're a B2B marketer, you should be creating eBooks only because they lead the chart. Uh, that certainly should be part of your mix. But if the expectation is that that content's going to be delivering bottom of funnel leads and intent rich users, I would say you're probably gonna luck into that using an ebook. You need to have a proper mix of content that's specifically speaking to the entire funnel, but also uh, just what your intentions are. So, you know, sometimes the goal of a piece of content might be to simply externalize the brand and drive as much engagement as possible, yet still capture data and they weren't going to be SQLs, they're going to go into nurture. So things to consider there. Same thing would apply to any kind of naming convention. Just think of your prospect. I know a lot of times marketers might be guilty of two different things. One would be externalizing too much internal acronyms and positioning and branding and so on. The other is that they're can often be groupthink where maybe the CMO wants you to be saying something, uh, yet the tactical marketers and or demand gen team are really understanding what the buyer wants to hear or the prospect wants to hear. There could be a disconnect between some of that language to try your best to break through those observations. Um, the what doesn't resonate part is probably the most frustrating aspect of being in our position in the marketplace. And I always tend to externally refer to myself, especially the people who are like, what do you do for a living? My family, something like that. Uh, I would say I'm kind of like an air traffic control of B2B content. And so we get to see every single thing that's occurring across the platform, the good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent, and really have some key observations, not only based upon data, but also user feedback. And so when we talk about things that don't resonate, one way to summarize that is this slide. And so there's a million nuances leading up to the other elements of content that don't resonate. A lot of those just tend to be more topic specific, but one commonality across every market, every industry, every target audience is that if it's a brand forward piece of content, it will dramatically by orders of magnitude have less engagement with it than a piece of content specifically positioned on speaking to the pain points of your hopeful prospect. And so at the core, just stop talking about yourself, remove a ton of your present, your logos being forward, totally fine to have your logos on your content, but it shouldn't be, you know, how Netline talks about content marketing in 2020. People don't care, right? They care about what the underlying data might solve. In our case, it's that report for your company. It's going to be something completely different, but focus on that, please. And so when we're talking about takeaways for a marketer, and you really need to absorb some of that data, you can always ask yourself this slide and they're really simple concepts, but at any point, the answers don't really jive to what we've been talking about. I caution you to pause and just revisit that, maybe talk it over amongst the team, ask your peer what their thoughts are. And so expectations clear, right? You've got to have expectations aligned to, I would challenge every content marketer to have a focus of leads and ultimately pipeline. If you don't, I would say your position in the organization is in a tenuous position. Uh, it, it should absolutely be in your DNA to be thinking that way. Even you're in the consumer space, it doesn't matter. If you're in an extremely long sales cycle, there's still a ton of data points in between now and purchase that allows you to further bolster the value of those engagements. So what are you going to do once you capture the leads from said content? So that's where consumption gap data comes into play. You can reference some of those things in the timing. How quickly you're going to follow up, we talked about that. Will we be leading with a me first voice and or message? So again, stop talking about your brand, don't do that. And then lastly, once marketing's kind of done their component, how does marketing intermix with what sales is going to do and continuously support 
that lead and or that prospect and hopefully that buyer with content that continuously educates them. So to me, this is all about finding a safety net, right? If you've got content, uh, content marketing in your jurisdiction and you're being tasked with ultimately demonstrating ROI on your efforts, right? Whether that's you, your team, your content itself, you need to be thinking about how you can get your content in front of the types of users that will actively convert into pipeline at some point. And so there's a multitude of ways of doing that uh, for purposes of this exercise. I'm really gonna have you focus on ways of hyper-targeting professionals, but also keep in mind that that goal of the campaign isn't just to have a successful byproduct, but also structure a campaign so that you can successfully align the pricing model of the campaign with success attributes such as qualified leads and or pipeline influence. And so if you're paying on a CPM basis and trying to back into an effective CPL, it's always gonna be challenging. It's not that you can't do it, but I would, I would definitely go into mind saying, well, if my content's being tasked with generating highly qualified leads specific to certain company sizes, job functions, job levels, even targeted accounts, then that's the pricing model I should be pursuing. I should be trying to run campaigns on a cost per lead basis. Once that campaign's up and running, you're certainly gonna wanna have access to a ton of real-time reports that allow you to visualize that data, better understand how the content's resonating with your targeted audiences, what audience is not resonating with. I think Peter will talk about that in a little bit. And then also, um, you know, where's wh how can you actually optimize this based on the data coming through? There's nothing more confusing for marketing to say, you're looking at a spreadsheet and saying, yeah, we delivered 500 leads this month or this quarter to sales team, but I don't really have any actionable takeaways there other than saying I hit my goal. I would challenge you as a marketer to don't allow that to be the end of your journey, right? You don't, you don't want to be in a position where you're just simply saying I hit my number goal uh, unless that's revenue based, right? If you're just simply counting, whether it's traffic, view time, uh, time spent on page, or ultimately even just leads, that's, that's again, going to put you in a tenuous position. So think about how you can further bolster what you are articulating internally. And making that happen quickly uh, is really vital, right? You, you don't want to be aligned with vendors and or doing manual work where data is going from one location to another days or weeks later. I mean, I've heard of some organizations where the data actually is sitting for a month before it's onboarded into their marketing automation system. That's terrifying. You shouldn't be doing that. So definitely challenge your internal teams, but also external vendors that real-time connectors into every third-party system is mandatory. And so at this moment, I'm going to hand it over to Peter. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about not only how he uses some of that data to drive his own strategy, but a little bit more about Topalti, uh, where they're going and where he's found success in his content marketing strategy. So Peter, off to you. All right, thank you so much. That was an awesome intro and I even learned, learned a lot and, and things that I'm gonna be taking back to our team to strategize for our Q4 campaigns. That's uh, great. But yeah, just, just to start a little bit about Topalti. Um, Topalti, if, uh, if you're not fluent in Hebrew, it does stand for we handled it. Um, what we handle is the automation of the whole payables process. Um, so people need to get paid. Uh, you know, People like to get paid on time. And we have a solution that allows companies to do that um, in, a, in an automated way so they don't have to worry about it. And we eliminate the 80% of, of the payables workflow for our customers. Speaking of customers, um, some of the customers uh, that we do this for um, include Roblox, which has been, I know, for a lot of the, the parents at home, they know their kids have been spending a lot of time on that since they haven't been able to socialize and um, be out with their, their friends or, or classmates. Um, and Zola, the wedding registry company, um, Peak is a is a travel uh, travel organization platform. Um, it run, runs the gamut, but a lot of nice logos that we have um, under that, that we manage their payables for. And our our solution is split into two different workflows. One, the accounts payable workflow um, is for companies that are making the typical net. 
D payments, net 10, 15, 30, 60 payments to, to vendors that help their operation run. Um, and in this situation, we layer on top of some of the biggest ERPs in the world, um, including NetSuite, QuickBooks Online, and Sage Intact. Um, so I'll, I'll be getting into this later, but being able to know accounts payable style companies that um, have these technologies um, when we're getting leads is a huge qualifier for us. Um, and then on the other side is the mass pay workflow, which are a lot of the more modern companies. Um, if you think of the Airbnbs, Ubers, Lyft, um, in our case, Twitch, ClassPass, or Postmates, these companies rely on people that aren't direct employees that might, you know, have have a side business renting out their house on Airbnb. Um, that might be a, a class pass instructor um, on the side or an instructor at a gym that's on class pass on the side. Twitch people that are really good at video games and uh, want to have a good personality and want to stream themselves playing video games. When they sign up on the Twitch platform there and enter their payment information, they're actually entering it on the Tapalti payment portal. So as soon as they do that, Twitch doesn't have to worry. And those people are all easily uh, getting, getting their payments on time. So the sales challenges with this, um, the one um, that, that this slide does not mention, but I'll get into after um, explaining that is that we have very niche, um, we have very niche industries uh, that, that oftentimes do not match up to the marketing vendors that we work with. Um, for example, in that mass pay side of our business, um, we call some of the industries online marketplace, uh, online services, ad tech, which I think, you know, if you're, you're doing targeting on specific channels, that would be summarized as like internet, I know is, is what they call it on LinkedIn. So it's, it's tough to get a one-to-one -one from our industries to what the vendors we work with have, but but we've found out ways to to most closely match that. Um, and then going into to what I have listed here is many target accounts have, uh, I'll say 50 or 100 or less employees. Um, so especially on that mass pay side, these companies remain very lean just because they have all these individual contributors who are helping their um, their success and, and their, their company grow. So they're keeping the actual inter internal company very lean. So these decision makers wear many, many hats. And automating payments for them is not a, a super high priority because they might be using a, a solution that gets the job done. Um, but as they scale and grow, it's not gonna be adequate. So our sales team needs to have that messaging in place to know that you know you're you're going to have to start thinking about a way to automate more payments as you continue to grow, and that's the messaging that they have to get across. Uh, in that's interesting, Peter. You know, I think when you when you said that your target prospect within those accounts tends to wear many hats, that's something that again, if you if you're publishing a good amount of content as part of your content marketing strategy, it's a great thing to remind marketers break that content down into bite-sized pieces that speak to those different hats that someone could be wearing. And usually you've got this already done. So it just needs uh, a little bit new of a presentation a freshening up and you've created a new piece for that really distinct pain point uh, versus giving that person that wears a ton of hats and said, here's all the content we have, read it, try to find what specifically hits your pain point. That's going to be a push. It's a challenge. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, uh, that's something that, that you'll, you'll see in our content strategy. It's, it's very, very broken apart, but I think it could be shortened even further just so it is that bite size. So I, I do appreciate that comment. Thank you. Um, cool. And, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about how our ABM program has evolved. Um, and I've been at Topalti for, I think I did the math, 27 months now. So just over two years. Um, and when I first started, our entire company was around 100 employees. And now we have more than that just within sales. Um, we're 
probably hovering around 350 total employees, 150 or so on the sales team. Um, so a lot of growth and it's been really exciting to see the ABM program uh, account-based everything. I, I, I keep saying account-based marketing, but it wouldn't be able to run without our sales team um, co contributions. But um, when I first started, we were pretty much just working with our one strategic sales rep where we were meeting on a, a weekly basis. We'd have a spreadsheet or a Salesforce report with his top 30 accounts built out and we'd just meet and, and provide any updates on, on any progress that he's made within the account. And then if, if the marketing team had any breakthroughs or any, you know, if we notice any signals of new hires, funding, um, just any news around the company that we can use to personalize the outreach to that account. Um, but now way more, way more scaled, way more everyone on the sales team has the ability to uh, take advantage of account-based marketing campaigns. Um, and we have a, a massive database built out. We recently switched our sales team to be territory-based. Um, and we have this, this core account criteria that um, is specific to uh, define our ideal customer profile and, and from, a, from a graphic standpoint. Um, and we have our inner core, outer core universe. We even have our non-universe accounts, but um, we, we have, we, we didn't have what marketing was using for our campaigns, you know, could have deferred from what sales was using for targeting. But now with this core account criteria, everyone's playing off the same, the same rules. So it's, it's scaled very, very successfully. So I'm happy to get that. Um, and our ABM tech stack, um, we have we have quite a few tools for our website experience. Um, for intent signals and display and social, we use Sixth Sense. Um, and for sales outreach, we use Groove for um, email flows and Sendoso for direct mail. Now I will get into the content. Um, and as mentioned earlier, very niche target audiences. So we have a great content team that develops pieces of content at a, re a consistent basis for all of our different uh, sub verticals. So we have content for accounts payable use cases, content for mass payment use cases. Um, we have the generic content that is always good to include in our, our marketing nurture flow or for um, the sales team using their outreach. This one, for example, um, 10 financial best practices for remote workforce. Um, and David, you mentioned, you know, don't stop talking about yourself. And I think, you know, this is a, a perfect piece for, for this moment in time that we created. Um, Cause you know, anyone on a finance team could, could download it. It could be, you know, someone that's not the senior manager uh, or a director that's managing people and they could download it and provide these ideas that they, they learn in this piece of content to their team on their weekly huddle. And Absolutely. Yeah, like and they, it's, they contributed. it's great because that piece, you can kind of break down the elements as to what and why it's positioned for success, right? It's got a number in it. So you right off the bat went into a numerical and listical format financial speaks to your target audience and then best practices all about making it sound simple and then lastly the remote workforce yeah as you said spot on timing really relevant reactionary content that's tapping into everyone's pain point yeah so lots of good stuff in in one sentence there thanks i'll tell the content team <laughs> <laughs> sure thing um and then broken down by erp um and again if we're doing net new targeting, it can be tough to tar it's, it's possible. Um, but we, we do use this in specific campaigns, but not when we're only targeting by the job function or job title, um, because we don't know if the, the company has Sage Intact or NetSuite in these examples. But if we are targeting an audience where we know or have strong confidence that the you know 90 percent 
99% of the accounts have that ERP, then we can um, promote this to them because it is, it is something that they would hopefully find helpful um, in their processes. Awesome. So as mentioned, we're, we're targeting finance decision makers with these pinpointed pieces of content based off of industry, use case, job function, and many, many more different. And this is uh, what we use for our targeting uh, for our netline campaigns. Um, so we're filtering and not um, going for any students, consultants, bogus info, uh, competitors, or duplicates. Um, we're targeting US only. Um, we do sell internationally, but our sales teams territories are aligned only to the US and then they kind of round robin any um, international accounts, but we're focused on US, so we target US only. And we target companies with 50 to 1,000 employees, which is pretty much our sweet spot. Mass pay does, as mentioned, tend to skew a little bit lower, um, but 1,000 is, is pretty much our, our threshold because companies that have more than 1,000 employees most likely will have um, a, a pretty solid solution in place um, job area, finance, and accounting. We also go after IT because there's oftentimes engineers or, or technical team that has to actually implement and put this solution together. Um, so the finance and accounting would have the pain point, but the IT and technical team should be familiar with um, their the AP automation because they have to actually build that into their product. Um, and then job levels manager and above. Um, and then this is going back to the industries and, and we've worked with Netline very closely, analyzed the leads that were coming in. And these were the industries that matched up the, the closest to our, um, our best performing industries out of what was available within the Netline platform. Um, and then also, obviously we wanna get their business email addresses. So our sales team is not hitting them on their personal Gmail. Uh, and then just a little, little, very brief, quick look under the hood. Um, within the Netline portal, we have visibility into all of the campaigns that we run, and we run our campaigns on a quarterly basis. Um, so we can go in and check out performance on that level. And then going even deeper, um, we can look at all of the different leads reports. Our leads are de delivered on a weekly basis, so you know we can cross-check performance on a week-over-week -week basis. And then the, the good leads view. So this is broken down to the lead level and it's, it's a great way to sort and filter and just get a quick good look at where most of our good leads that meet the criteria are coming from. Then there is this, uh, this salvage view, which is, is very, very interesting and useful to us where someone could a, a lead could have been held back by netline because they didn't match the exact criteria. But if we, if, I go in, you know, once a month and look through the leads that were salvaged and do a cross check with say LinkedIn and notice that this is actually someone just because of our niche industries, they might've been held back, but it was someone at an account that is in our target audience, then we can go ahead and, and push that over to uh, our, our marketing automation and CRM. Yeah, Peter, that's a, that's a great observation there because it also lets you start understanding, um, you know, maybe you had a reason for the filters that were in place that made these people be, uh, have a rejected status, but simultaneously it could start al also showing you how your content's resonating with different audiences. Even though your filters said you didn't want them, they wanted to learn more about your content. Sometimes that's a great way to further optimize your content to not speak to a certain audience, right? Because if you're attracting attention from someone that you really don't want, that's not good. It probably says your content saying something off script uh, or not specific enough. And then conversely, if you're seeing a lot of like personas registering, that tends to be a market opportunity where maybe you didn't think about going into a certain industry, but clearly a lot of folks in it, in that industry have that problem. So you might want to unearth that and perhaps devise your own content marketing strategy around that data. So many good tips. I wish I, I, I was in the audience not presenting so I could write all these notes down. But 
I have a funny we'll feeling see. we'll be able to talk about these things. So <laughs> exactly. Um, sweet. So the the next slide is our our leads report, um, and this is delivered whenever one of those uh, lead uploads comes through, and just gives a nice over a uh, high level overview. Um, so our our most popular job areas, job levels, employee size, main industry and country, which is all you know right in line with our targeting. Um, we, you can see we do have sea level, which is only 26%, but was higher than other, um, other job levels. Um, so it, it's, if 26% was the highest percent great. Certain job level, then that means we're getting good distribution. Um, and then just wanted to give you a, a look at what the leads look like when they're passed to Salesforce. Um, so our inbound marketing team, uh, inbound sales team can easily see exactly what piece of content the, um, the lead downloaded. So they can follow up accordingly with relevant messaging. Now back to uh, where I, I was talking about core leads. Um, what's interesting, um, and I believe this was for the quarter to date, um, what's interesting is the green is our mass pay leads and you can see pretty much all of our mass pay leads are core accounts. And that's because in order for an accounts payable lead to be core, we have to have the ERP field filled in in Salesforce. So I, what happens is as we get that information and leads in our system get enriched, these universe and non-universe bars go way down. So if a, if a lead gets marked as a mass pay industry and they fit the company, si uh, the company size range, they'll be core account right away. So these are, these are really good numbers that we're getting from Netline. Um, yep. and, and broken out by industry, um, as you saw in a few, a few slides earlier, um, our uh, business services is what we're, we're tar one of our industries that we're targeting on. And that luckily is a one-to-one -one match with one of our industries in Salesforce and is one of our top um, four industries that we're getting for inner and outer core leads. So we're getting a lot of leads in business services, software, technology, and travel, recreation, and leisure. Um, and then inbound lead follow-up. Um, and one thing I actually I, I meant to actually mention was on a few slides ago when I showed the CRM view, our uh, our inbound inbound sales team manager was like, "Is there a way to get a clickable link?" push to those marketing notes in, in CRM um, so that the, the team can just click right on it. So the, the team's always thinking about ways to, to optimize and adjust this messaging. Um, and this, this email that's, that's on the screen now that was in our flow was actually switched because they didn't want to say, I saw that you recently downloaded the ebook. They switched it up to make it more high level reaching out about, you know, a, a specific problem. And now that we know those, those content consumption data values, maybe we can do another AB test using those content consumption rules for follow-up. Um, just because, uh, you know, if you send someone a message that says, I saw you recently downloaded and they didn't get around to reading it yet, like, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. And then, right. Like unsubscribe. So, yeah. Um, we we definitely will be doing a lot more A/B testing on the, the lead follow up, but just uh, two examples here. So, as you can see on the second email, um, it's it's just more about the company, um, not about the content they downloaded. But um, definitely want to follow up more more in line with with the, the rules. Of um, and with all this, I know this is what you guys have been waiting around for. We've generated 6,000 qualified leads from Netline to date. 
Um, and we've seen a 20% increase in qualified leads, which is representing what will hopefully be a million dollars of revenue growth by the end of the year. Yeah, that's awesome. It's always super exciting to see, uh, you know, and a lot of the, as Peter said, almost all of our clients have ex really ex extended sales cycles and they're a bit of a painful process. So seeing these types of numbers come out towards the tail end and hopefully with additional growth, that's uh, it's you know ultimately super rewarding for us and I'm sure for Peter as well. So that's amazing. Nice work. You get a sticker. Sweet. Yeah. Thank you. I'll put it right on. All right, cool. <laughs> right over to Palti. It's Palti in that line. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, I think that the takeaway for us here was to give you some high level market level observations, but allow Peter to go into more of the micro extraction and going to market with his content, a strategy firmed up around that. Uh, and ultimately even giving you some insights into what's happened with those leads once they've started to engage with the brand and showed an intent to actually do so. And so I want to walk away uh, today with leaving you with a few free items in addition to all of the knowledge that Peter and I just shared. And so uh, there's two key elements here. First is a tool called Audience Explorer. You can get to it straight off of netline.com. It's right on the homepage and also in the resources section. Quite simply, uh, this tool was created to be a real-time view into all of that B2B content consumption behavior that I had talked about early on when we talked about the report. And so historically, you know, we created an ebook and now it's actually a print book too. But clients were always left wondering, it's like, what does my audience look like today? Or I wish I, I, wish I could slice and dice this ebook into stuff that's really specific. And like Peter brought up, can I look at that data from a perspective of a specific uh, country, perhaps? So the answer to all of those questions now is yes, through this tool. And it allows you to really understand on a daily basis how your personas are changing. What types of content do they gravitate towards? Completely free, ungated. Uh, we have no idea when you're using it, how you're using it, who you are. So dig in. If it helps you beyond Netline, that's great. Let us know, actually. Uh, that'd be a great thing to know. And then lastly, we have our 2020 report. Uh, the report itself is accessible off the site. It's also available here. And so what I'd uh, really hope that you do is grab a copy. If you find yourself compelled that you want a print copy, please reach out and say so as well. We have a limited amount of those, but we try to spread the wealth around as much as possible, especially in these days where we're all stuck at our home offices. And uh, yeah, that's really it. So the URL for that, again, is it's uh, bit.ly forward slash netline CMW for content marketing world. Uh, or you can just go to our homepage and grab it there at netline.com. So I'd like to get you out of here on time. I'm sure you still have a ton more sessions to get to. Uh, Peter, thank you so much again for A, agreeing to participate. <laughs> B, sharing some great nuggets, and lastly, C, sharing some amazing metrics. I hope a lot of the folks attending today can aspire uh, aspire to get to some levels of the, those types of results. So nice job. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Good luck with the rest of the show. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.